right, everyone. Welcome to the STOA. Uh, today we have Jack Hunter, anthropologist exploring the borderlines of consciousness, religion, and the paranormal. Uh, and he's the author of Manifesting Spirits, an anthropological study of mediumship and the paranormal. And uh, today we're going to talk about ontological flooding, uh, a term I discovered uh, recently that uh, I believe Jack coined. Um, and the way I view it so far, uh, perhaps I'll be uh, have a, a greater awareness of what it means, but uh, it's really embodying different uh, ontologies by viewing different perspectives. And if that's the case, it's something that I've been doing for a while here uh, at the STOA and some of my uh, intellectual adventures. So I'm quite excited about uh, this session and the prospect of uh, this term and Jack's work uh, more generally. So how today is going to work, I'm going to take in Jack in a moment. Uh, and he's going to uh, present, share his screen, and then we'll pivot to a QA. and a If you have questions anytime, put them in the chat. I'll call on you. You can read your question to, to Jack, or I can read it on your behalf if you don't want to be on YouTube. Um, that being said, Jack, welcome to the STOA. That's lovely. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. So I'll just share my screen. Oh, it says host is disabled participant screen sharing. <laughs> you, you should be able to do it now. Got it now. Okay. Can everybody see that okay? Okay, so uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about ontological flooding. Um, it's a, a term that I came up with um, a few years ago, but in the context of uh, my doctoral research, which was a, an ethnographic study of um, a group of spirit mediums in Bristol. And I did participant observation with these uh, these mediums, and I had some unusual experiences myself. And basically, what I realized, you know, over the course of doing my research, was that you know, in, in the process of constructing like a literature review of previous research on mediumship, was that there was loads of different um, explanations, lots of different theories. So some would explain it in terms of psychological factors, others in terms of cognitive factors. Some people would explain it, you know, in terms of uh, illness or you know, brain damage and things like that. So there's loads of different explanations. But what it seemed to me in, uh, you know, participating in these groups was actually that none of these explanations really accommodated the true complexity of what was going on. And I'm not necessarily saying that anything like even amazing or paranormal was going on, but there was much more going on than any of these single explanations could really account for. Okay, so I came to this idea of ontological flooding from that realization, essentially that we need a framework that can take into account many different perspectives in order to make sense of any given uh, situation. And I carried on building on this idea of ontological flooding in a couple of other places. One in uh, this book, Damned Facts, which uh, takes on the work of Charles Fort, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. And another paper in this book on continuing bonds in bereavement and how um, you know, being open to many possibilities uh, might actually be helpful for people in those kind of bereavement situations. So anyway, that's kind of in a nutshell where the idea came from. Okay, so this is what I want to talk about now for the next 20 or so minutes. First of all, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell us what I mean by the word ontology, why I use it and uh, you know, how I use it. Then we're going to look at bracketing in the social sciences, which uh, ontological flooding is really a response to bracketing in the social sciences. So we'll think about some of the limitations of bracketing and how bracketing actually creates what Charles Fort called damned facts. And then the overall aim is to think about how we can um, develop a, a position where we can accommodate all of those damned facts, uh, sort of a very inclusive way of looking at the world. So let's delve in. So if we break the word ontology up. I use this word because um, it, it, it kind of became very popular in anthropology over the last few years with the ontological turn in anthropology. But basically, anthropologists began to realize that when we're talking about other people's worldviews, other people's cultures, we're not just talking about necessarily about beliefs, but we're actually talking about whole other worlds, whole other ways of being. Okay, so we use the, when we use the word ontology, it can have a couple of different meanings. But in essence, you know, the word ontos, ancient Greek word ontos refers to being or existence, and logos, the ology part of the term, uh, you know, usually refers to a discourse or the study of. So what we're doing now, essentially, having a discourse about 
existence is ontology. So we're all doing ontology. But we can also talk about an ontology. Okay, so an ontology is a model of all that exists, you know, from a particular perspective. So, you know, the general, the standard sort of ontology of, let's say, Western science is, is a materialist ontology, where matter is the kind of essential building block of everything, and we can understand phenomena by breaking it down into matter, you know, into particles and things like that. Okay, so we can have an ontology, which is a model of all that exists. But, you know, that ontology is only one of many ontologies. And this is what anthropology reveals, is that actually there are many different ways of looking at the world and interpreting it. Okay, so this opens, well, this basically gives us a question, you know, about how, how can we be sure that our ontology, you know, the, the one that we're beginning from in our Western academic work is actually the correct ontology. Um, there's actually no way of, uh, of telling, really. Okay. Um, so like I said, the dominant ontology in Western science and in the social sciences is a form of materialism. And it filters down into the social sciences in interesting ways, which I'll, I'll touch on now. Okay. But it's important to remember that this Western materialist ontology is just one amongst many ontologies. So we need to think of a way of thinking about all of these different possibilities um, at the same time, essentially. Um, the influence of, of these dominant ontologies becomes especially apparent when it comes to things like um, experiences or beliefs or phenomena that challenge uh, the underlying assumptions of the dominant ontology. Okay, so anything that kind of threatens it in some way kind of gets shut down. And this is true in anthropology as well. And see this, the way that this uh, dominant idea has trickled down into the social sciences. So this is uh, Edith Turner. She's one of my big uh, influences. She's an anthropologist. Uh, she was the wife of Victor Turner, who's a very famous and influential anthropologist. And the basic story is that uh, she had participated in rituals in, uh, in Africa uh, with her husband in the 1950s and 60s, but had been very detached in the way that she did it. And then after her husband died, she decided to go back to participate in these same rituals again, but in a much more engaged and participatory way. And the story pans out that she had uh, her own extraordinary experience where she saw this uh, sort of like an ecto gray ectoplasmic blob pulled out the back of an afflicted patient by a medicine uh, man. Okay, so this transformed her understanding then of these belief systems that she'd previously been you know, studying. Now they seem to be more than just beliefs and actually some kind of an experiential reality. Okay, so she wrote a really amazing paper um, called um, about um, researching spirits, about asking whether it's a tabooed or permitted field of study. And she says, again and again, anthropologists witness spirit rituals. And then again and again, some indigenous exeget tries to explain that the spirits are present. And furthermore, that rituals are the central events of their society. And the anthropologist proceeds to interpret them differently. So this is the key point. There seems to be a kind of force field between the anthropologist and her or his subject matter, making it impossible for her or him to come close to it, a kind of religious frigidity. And she ultimately says that we anthropologists need training to see what the natives see. Okay, so this is all part of the same project, really, is how do we accommodate these kinds of uh, phenomena that seem to challenge what our you know, dominant framework says exists and what doesn't exist. Okay, so Edith Turner's frustration is actually in response to, like I was saying, this dominant approach within the social sciences, which is actually a form of bracketing. And we get this idea from uh, phenomenology and specifically from the work of Husserl. And he proposes this idea of bracketing or epoche um, as a method of giving a nice, clean phenomenological description of an experience. So his idea is that we put aside any questions about whether the experience is real or not. Okay, so we get rid of any questions like that and we just describe it. So in, you know, from a phenomenological perspective, it doesn't matter whether it's real or not. And all that matters is how, it, how it's experienced by the experiencer, okay? And interpreted and understood. Okay, so actually phenomenological approaches often opt to ignore the ontological question altogether. You know, you put a bracket around that question 
and you don't have to confront it. And obviously that opens up a whole load of amazing things that you can explore without having to worry about the reality of it, okay? But this is also problematic because you're bracketing off questions about what actually exists. <laughs> And what if these things really do exist? Or there are things that are more than just beliefs, for example. So here's the uh, phenomenological anthropologist, Michael Jackson, explaining this. He says, the phenomenologist suspends inquiry into the hidden determinants of belief and action in order to describe the implications, intentions, and effects of what people say, do, and hold to be true. Okay, so it doesn't matter whether these things are really true or not. What matters is how people you know, interpret them and believe in them and what they do with that in their lives. Okay, so like I said, that's good up to a certain point, uh, but it starts to become problematic. And we can see here in the work of um, Evans Pritchard, one of the founding fathers of modern anthropology, how this kind of becomes a problem. He says in his book, um, Theories of Primitive Religion, as I understand the matter, there's no possibility of knowing whether the spiritual beings of primitive religions or of any others have any existence or not. And since that's the case, the anthropologist cannot take the question into consideration. So this effectively shut down the question, you know, the, 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 the uh, debate over whether these things exist within anthropology. And it, it made it so that anthropologists could study all sorts of different things as long as they were only studying different cultures or different sets of beliefs. Okay, and this leads into, you know, relativism essentially, where you can't, you can't judge one culture's beliefs against another essentially. But what this also turns into is a sort of security blanket for the dominant ontology, you know, within Western academia. Because really what they're saying is, these other systems are just beliefs, but because our system is founded on empirical uh, science essentially, materialism, then our system of beliefs is actually the correct one, okay? So it actually gets them out of this situation of having to confront the fact that it challenges their model by saying that it's just beliefs and our model is actually the correct one, okay? Um, so it's presented as if it's an attempt to be neutral. And I think in most cases, it is a genuine attempt to be neutral, but you can see how these underlying ontological assumptions are starting to interfere with the way that we interpret and understand you know, ethnographic data. So the sociologist Jeremy Northcott wrote a really interesting paper about this in the early 2000s, and it's been a massive influence on me, this paper. He suggests that uh, ontological bracketing has got really serious limitations, especially in the study of supernatural beliefs and paranormal experiences, which is my uh, field. Okay, so he, this is what he says. I hold that there is a fundamental bias in bracketing approaches that arises from the fact that an analyst taking such an approach must inevitably make a decision about where to place the brackets and hence define some aspect of supernormal belief or activity as being social in nature. So if it's defined as social, then that's fine. You can study that as an anthropologist. And then which part of it isn't, okay? Which in itself is an ontological claim. So it's anything but a neutral position. You're actually putting up the brackets. You're saying, you're, you're staking your claim and saying, this is stuff that I can talk about and all of that other stuff is maybe something else or doesn't exist or, or whatever. Okay, so, you know, this isn't, I don't think this is how Husserl imagined bracketing panning out. It was an attempt to experience the world as it really is. Um, but the way that it's actually filtered out into social scientific theory and percolated into the mainstream uh, has ended up in this position where it's basically, uh, yeah, reinforcing the the dominant view and turning all other perspectives into just systems of belief and culture. And so this process of uh, bracketing um, and excluding things from study, so saying, well, there's stuff, some stuff in anthropology that we just can't deal with, creates what Charles Fort called damned facts. Okay, so I'll just talk a little bit about Charles Fort now. Uh, Charles Fort was a collector of anomalies in the the late 1800s and early 1900s. He would collect all sorts of different things from like fish falling from the sky through to like, you know, early sort of flying saucer experiences and all sorts. And he developed a philosophical framework that he called intermediatism. And this was his 
way of incorporating all of this strange data into uh, you know what he thought of as sort of like an expanded science okay he defined intermediatism intermediatism as a position in which nothing is real uh, but nothing is unreal and all phenomena are approximations in one way between realness and unrealness so what he's doing there is basically putting everything onto the same uh, level playing field you know all phenomena even the things that we take most for granted exists somewhere on a spectrum between realness and unrealness. Okay, so it's a, it's a nice, interesting way of, uh, you know, breaking down the old models and offering a new perspective on things. So all of these anomalies are just as real or unreal as any, you know, established scientific fact. Okay, and Jeffrey Kripal summarizes this idea nicely. He says, with this term, thought meant to refer to a philosophical position that involves the refusal of all easy polarizing answers to the problems of the paranormal and the related insistence that whatever such phenomena are or are not, they cannot be mapped onto the cognitive grids of the pair's mental material, real, unreal, subjective, objective, and so on. So he's saying that, you know, we need a new sort of framework that doesn't rely on all of these old models in order to accommodate this new data, okay? Uh, Charles Fort also talked about dominance, and I've used the word dominant quite a lot already um, but this is why it, it's almost like a precursor to Thomas Kuhn's concept of paradigms uh, except it came out you know like 60 years earlier um, for thought a dominant was an established mode of thought within science and culture essentially and these dominants shift like a paradigm shift um, as data builds up so he says in our acceptance dominance in their succession displaced preceding dominance not only because they're more nearly positive, so not only because they more accurately describe the world, but because the old dominance as recruiting mediums play out. So the old paradigms no longer are uh, bringing new data. Okay, so what he says then, uh, he says our expression is that the new dominant, so this new paradigm of wider inclusions, and this is really where ontological flooding takes off from, um, is now manifesting throughout the world and that the old exclusionism is everywhere breaking down. So the idea is that if we can have an inclusive uh, framework that brings stuff in, instead of putting brackets up and excluding different perspectives, uh, then we might move closer towards some kind of <laughs> understanding of what's going on in this reality. Okay, so this is uh, ontological flooding then. And the, the reason that I use flooding is because it's almost kind of like a little play on words with Charles Fort's damned facts. It's almost like these facts, they put a dam up that holds back all of this anomalous data that's pushing in all the time. And my idea is that instead of putting those brackets up in the first place, we go into our research with no brackets <laughs> at all. And in fact, be open to as many possibilities as we can. Um, and, you know, in this way, then we can start to understand the, the nuance and complexity of things without trying to force it into a reductive explanation. Okay, or even a single explanation. In fact, there may be many more. So this is how I described it in a paper. So rather than bracketing out questions of ontology, fulfill it that they might lead to truths or damned facts uh, that cannot fit into the established order of Western academia's dominant ontology. I suggest that we essentially open the floodgates of ontological possibilities. This places all ontologies on an equal footing, so that while ontological bracketing protects and reinforces the mainstream consensus reality, what we might call ontological flooding destabilizes it, opens it up to questioning, exploration and expansion, and essentially says that you know, it is just one amongst many different um, possible interpretations of the world or models of the world. Um, but I think it's an important point to make that, you know, saying that there are many different interpretations doesn't mean that we can be any less critical, you know, in trying to find, find out what's going on. It doesn't mean we basically accept everything as given truth. In fact, it means that we have to be you know, even more critical and even more thoughtful, um, you know, in order to deal with this complexity. And we have to be especially critical of any model um, that claims to be definitive, you know, as a complete explanation. Because at the end of the day, all of these, all of these models, ontologies and frameworks 
are human constructions and so are most likely going to be you know fallible in some way okay so we never no one ever has a, a complete picture and uh, it's kind of um, arrogant actually <laughs> to think that we have a complete picture or that any single model is a complete model okay so ontological flooding then in the context of my own research uh, with mediumship this is how it kind of panned out for me so i realized that um you know the dominant explanatory framework for understanding mediumship in even in western culture more generally especially since you know after the second world war has been in terms of fraud it's a fraud is it's just like you know what are mediums? Mediums are frauds. That's the kind of a go-to mainstream understanding. Or there are other sorts of uh, reductionism that are available, which, you know, in psychology, there have been attempts to explain mediumship in terms of psychological disorders and things. Sociology has tried to explain it in terms of um, social protest and it, how it performs all sorts of various social functions. Um, even people have suggested that it can be explained in terms of nutrient deficiency and things like that. But the very fact that there are so many of these competing um, arguments, all of which can, you know, claims to be a complete explanation, suggests that there's much more going on here than any single one of them can adequately account for. And it doesn't necessarily mean that, like I was saying, that, it's, that spirits exist, although I think that there is an e there's evidence for that and it's something that we have to consider as a possibility. But it also performs other functions beyond fraud, as in like, um, you know, as a social gathering for people, as bereavement, as counselling, as making sense of extraordinary experiences, and all of these various different kinds of, uh, of functions. So you can see, you know, immediately explain or dismissing something as fraud, <laughs> one simple explanation doesn't quite cut the mustard. Okay, so my approach that I worked on through my thesis and ultimately into this book, has emphasized all of the multiple different contributing processes that are involved in mediumship. So we've got things like performance in the body, you know, and you could take any of these ones and probably people, not many anthropologists have taken any of these as individual definitive explanations. You know, for example, that mediumship is just a performance or mediumship is just a bodily phenomenon or mediumship is just a psychological phenomenon. But what I'm saying is that actually none of these guys is wrong, but that their perspectives are only pieces of the puzzle. Okay, and actually mediumship becomes, you could almost say, something like more than the sum of its parts. And this is where I think it actually resonates with um, more sort of like an ecological model, which is another story really, but it resonates here that, you know, ontological flooding uh, emphasizes interconnectivity of different perspectives, um, but also the interconnectivity of different processes within any given situation. So, you know, psychological processes feeding into sociological and cultural processes, which are also linked into physiological processes um, and so on. Okay, so it's saying that really any situation is going to require multiple perspectives in order to understand it adequately. And in my own work, then I came to the conclusion that spirits are actually uh, manifested, kind of brought into existence through all of these social processes that are going, not just social, you know, physiological, psychological as well. Um, so it's almost like they are emergent phenomena in, in some kind of way. And I don't mean that to say that they, they don't have any independent existence, but that they're just, you know, the whole thing is a, a participatory process. Okay, and that the emergence of spirits is just one phenomena amongst many other processes that are going on as well. Like I was saying, performance and psychological functions and social functions and all of that kind of stuff. Okay, so I'll just uh, summarize my uh, argument then. <laughs> so uh, Edith Turner's frustration that we started off with is kind of um, as a result of this tendency to bracket out issues of ontology and reality, especially in social scientific research on religion and the paranormal or extraordinary experiences. Okay, but Jeremy Northcott reminds us that, you know, this that actually placing these brackets up in the first place is itself an ontological choice. You know, you're making a, a demarcation of what things are acceptable for research and what things are not. 
So it's not a neutral perspective as much as it claims to be. So what can we develop a, a more neutral perspective? <laughs> so I've taken inspiration from other writers, you know, like Charles Fort, who have not necessarily been bound by the limitations of, uh, you know, the dominant academic models and things, although they've obviously interacted with, interacted with them and are aware of them and are kind of working against them in some way. You know, I think there are, there are interesting things that we can learn from there and incorporate in. Okay, so especially his idea of, um, you know, a new dominant of greater inclusivity. So ontological flooding then is my framework for making sense of and embracing complexity um, and interacting processes that give rise to these extraordinary experiences and crucially in the flux of ethnographic reality. So not thinking about these experiences as somehow separate from our everyday lives or anything, but actually as you know, part of all of these processes that are going on all the time. Okay, so this leads to a need for a range of perspectives, you know, not just individually, but actually simultaneously incorporating all of these different ideas, social, cultural factors, psychological, physiological, uh, psi factors from parapsychology and all of these kinds of things, as well as the influence of the non-human and other forms of mind and consciousness that may also be out there. So, you know, this isn't just relevant in the field of extraordinary experience research. I think it, it's an idea that can be applied in lots of different contexts, especially complex situations. And ultimately, it all lends itself towards, or it's kind of compatible with um, like pluralistic approaches uh, that take multiple different perspectives into consideration. Uh, compatibilist approaches where you can see, um, you know, for example, between traditional knowledge systems and uh, scientific uh, Western scientific knowledge systems, you know, they, are com they can be compatible in some way. And ultimately it emphasizes both diversity of perspectives um, and diversity of processes, as well as collaborative in inquiry. And I think really all of this kind of stuff would encapsulate what Charles Fort was talking about with his dominant of greater inclusivity, not bracketing and excluding stuff from study, but bringing everything in. Okay, so that's basically it in a nutshell. Uh, my understanding of ontological flooding. And then there's a bunch of references there uh, that you can follow up on. These papers here, uh, some, well, actually a couple of these are books, but some of these papers are freely available online where I kind of flesh out the idea a bit more as well. So there we go, I'll stop sharing. Awesome, uh, love it. Um, very, very interesting approach uh, to engaging with various perspectives in the ontological wild. Uh, so feel free to start putting your uh, questions in the chat. I'll call on you. You can uh, um, ask your question to Jack. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll warm you up with a, a question of my own. Um, like, could you maybe describe the experience of uh, when you engaged in, say, ontological bracketing, a certain phenomenon compared to ontological flooding? Like, how did you go about it? What was the actual practice of it? And um, what uh, results were different? Well, yeah, I mean, there's a number of ways that you can apply it. It can be used as a, a sort of an interpretive tool after the fact. So, you know, to bring in multiple different theory, theoretical perspectives and different ideas about something. So, you know, that, that's like a standard literature review kind of approach, really. Nothing too fancy about that. But you could also apply it in the context of participation. And, you know, like we were saying, the phenomenologist doesn't engage with questions of reality when they are doing their phenomenological inquiry. They just experience reality as it is without questioning it. But I'm saying instead, we should question it, <laughs> you know, in the experience, in the moment that we're having the experience and engage with it. Not like a traditional sort of anthropological detached observer approach, but actually a full on participatory engagement. And then actually opening yourself up to those possibilities, not just theoretically, <laughs> you know, but actually in the moment. So like a, an example from my own research was when um, I was, uh, there was one seance when the mediums couldn't attend. And so um, we had to, we basically did a development sitting where anyone could be the medium. And we all meditated. And this was a, this was a, a time when I 
let down my barriers, <laughs> my ontological barriers. We could have called it a boggle threshold as well. I talked about that elsewhere and um, allowed myself to kind of go with it, but it freaked me out. And I felt my hand basically become what I felt to be possessed essentially, or at least it was moving of its own accord. And I was in a strange state of mind where I was simultaneously, and this is again, you have, when you were in these experiences, they're so strange that in the experience, you have to take into consideration multiple perspectives. You, in fact, sometimes they are, the experiences are in fact, multiple perspectives playing out simultaneously. So in this experience, I could feel my physical body, but I could also feel that I was detached from my physical body. So I had two perspectives simultaneously. And I also felt a third factor, uh, which seemed to be controlling my hand. <laughs> or at least it felt like that. So this experience for me kind of is an ontologically flooded experience. There are many different possibilities of what this experience could be. But it, what it also did for me was become what um, anthropologist Zelshko Jokic has called a point of intersubjective entry into the, the world of mediums, where I now have at least the experience of what it feels like and I can expand that idea and imagine what it feels like to, to allow your body to be completely taken over. So, you know, I think that's an example of an ontologically flooded approach to, you know, researching mediumship, for instance, experiencing it, uh, taking into consideration multiple perspectives, and also trying to describe as many of those perspectives, you know, in your, in your description, your phenomenological description, you know, the physiological experiences, as well as the psychological, emotional things. Uh, and this is really what ethnography is, is good for, is what anthropologists kind of are trained to do. And that's why I think anthropology is actually the perfect vehicle for this um, approach. Mm. And, and uh, the other question I had is, um, do you see this uh, ontological flooding approach uh, in the participant realm? applicable outside of research, a domain of research. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you a story. I, I do what I, what I feel is anthropo uh, uh, ontological flooding all the time. Uh, and one moment is, is pretty salient was uh, when I was at this exorcist conference that a, a buddy brought me to. And it was just a, mostly traditional Catholics there. And I just like felt into the, almost like felt the belief space. There was like, I was fluttering between it. It was like a one moment I was just like, oh my God, I'm the only person here that doesn't believe in this stuff. And then I just kind of like let go and just fell into it. And just like, whew, just my, my reality of the world changed in that moment. Um, and it not only helped me inform my friend who invited me, who believed in demonic possession, helped me understand the, how this worldview can exist and sustains itself. But it also helped me understand other things like how evil can happen in the world or trauma or things like that. So it was so fucking informative. Um, but it kind of like tripped me up and disoriented me for a while, like, like going into that, that sort of reality tunnel and that ontology. Um, yeah. but I, I feel like I'm getting more skillful at doing it with people I encounter with all these different, like, you know, radical, radical worldviews and whatnot. Um, so I'm curious how you see it being applicable outside of the domain of, of academia research and, uh, how to go about it effectively and wisely. Yeah. Um, well, that's a good question. I mean, I think. Like I said at the at the end of the talk, it resonates with, you know, ideas about pluralism and diversity and all of this kind of stuff. So you know, it can play out in many different ways. Again, you know, it could play out in the social sphere, which would be, you know, to have as many, you know, live in diverse communities and things like that, to uh, to share ideas with other people, um, you know. You could, or it could be include, incorporated into the education system. And instead of seeing, this is another imp important area that I, I think about quite a lot. Instead of seeing, for instance, you know, in mainstream schools, all of the subjects as discrete subject areas, where you go to one class and then you go to maths and then you go to geography and then the, the two never come together. We're actually, you know, an ontologically flooded education system would show how all of these different subject areas interact with each other. <laughs> you know, more like the real world, essentially. So you, th 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 there's many different ways, I think, that it could be applied. And, you know, we don't even have to think about it 
in terms of ontological flooding. You could just think about it in terms of, you know, exploring different perspectives or, you know, or whatever, embracing diversity or mm. complexity. Yeah. And, and the whole, what, I, what I'd love to see, the whole, you know, the psychonaut movement, people explore psychedelics and like lucid dreaming. It's like belief itself is a psychoactive, you know, experience if you really go into it. Um, so it'd be cool to have like, you know, ontological flutters just exploring yeah. reality. Exactly. It's good for exploring reality with. <laughs> it's yeah. a tool for it. Right. All right. So let's pivot to the, the Q&A. Uh, uh, I will take in Tom first. Hey, Jack. I really enjoyed your presentation. I think it's a, a really cool way of thinking about a lot of different things. Um, and I, it aligns with my thing, which is consilience and, and these developments that have been happening in neurophysiology, where it's becoming very evident that um, sort of the reality is, if you like, to a degree, a, a creation of the brain and the social influences that we uh, experience. It's like uh, Viveki's glasses that we, we have to be looking through our glasses, but we can take the glasses off and have a look at those glasses. Um, and, and, and I think this new way of looking at the world <clears throat> sort of undermines the modernist, purely scientific mindset that, that um, is so pervasive right now in uh, parts of academia. So my question relates to vulnerabilities, because uh, one of the underlying themes in stoicism is that we need help with our vulnerabilities because we, we can be taken in by crazy stuff. So um, I'll, I'll give you some examples. When I, let's say I'm in Bangkok and I go to a Buddhist temple, I try and do ontological flooding by uh, doing what Peter was referring to. You, you, you try and just experience it without being judgmental. Uh, you, you, you smell the smells, you, you try and uh, vibe. And, and that's really cool and, 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 and uh, it makes the whole experience wonderful. But then let's say a Scientologist approaches one on the street yeah. and you're thinking to yourself, um, you know, am I at the top of a slippery slope to some craziness? And, and, and um, yeah, no, those two things are completely different. So how, how can you help uh, people like me figure out like what's good potentially good and 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 empowering versus what's evil and is going to take us to the dark side how 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 can yeah. you help this is a good question and uh, it's something that uh, that worries me a lot with the idea of ontological flooding <laughs> and it keeps me awake at night because it could be taken in many different ways and it could obviously be taken to support, you know, any number of perspectives. Uh, but this is why I'm saying that it's not, it's not um, a call to be to be slack, <laughs> and it's a, it's actually we have to be critical, and we have to think about these all of these perspectives. It doesn't mean that we have to adopt them, um, but you know we can um, engage them, yeah, and it, we can engage things in lots of different ways. It doesn't have to be, you know. It doesn't have to be going along with it, for example. You know, it could be, depending on the situation, you know, it could be uh, disagreeing with it, you know, based on other evidence, because you took, you've got to take into, into consideration all of the possibilities rather than, you know, limiting yourself to one. <laughs> so, my, you know, if you were truly being ontologically flooded, you know, you, would, you could engage with Scientology and participate in it, but not in yourself. Although, you know, whether Scientologists think <laughs> is a different matter, you know, but subscribe to it. But yeah, it's dangerous and tricky. People can, you can get taken in by all sorts of things. But that's why I stress to be critical and think about these things. The thinking about things is the, probably the most important thing, I think, <laughs> actually there, thinking. There is a, co a contradiction there though, isn't there? Because I mean, to really, do ontological flooding you've got to suspend the little parrot on your shoulder that's like judging everything and and if you don't suspend that little parrot uh you you, you can't really get into it um yeah but you need to so, so it's it's 
it's a little it's, it's a little weird isn't it <laughs> it is and it's but it's you know it's a it's an extension of the same problem that anthropologists have faced you know since they began going out into the field and living with other people you know there's so you can there's lots of different degrees along which you can become involved in it <laughs> uh there isn't actually a, any solid kind of um like solid solution to the problem i don't think other than thinking carefully and being critical <laughs> cool thanks tom um carl smith has something called double consciousness he came to the store and he talked about how to how to have that um yeah, exactly. and i find like acting i have an acting background and it also helps kind of really get into a, a belief space that's not your own um right. shayla you had your hand up i would like to ask your question Yes, I would. Thank you. Yeah, I was so excited about um, ontological flooding. I was very happy to be hearing from you, Jack. I'm and I, um, I wanted to just um, see how this resonates with you, because I'm a mediator and I do a lot of work in the field of collective trauma. And it feels to me there's something here for those fields, too, because the basic sense of separation that allows us to impose ourselves on other beings in profoundly harmful ways mm -hmm. um, is a kind of bracketing, right? Like in a way, violence, yeah. it, it, all, all kinds of violence are inherently um, embodying a kind of bracketing. And if I really, really want to respect you in a profound way, I have to be able to step inside your reality. I can't do it by by staying safe and outside. And, and so there is something I've discovered in this kind of work, very edgy and very risky, which the Western mind is very uncomfortable with, about allowing myself to let myself be flooded by your reality. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, I think you're right. There is a and uh, this is what my chapter in the um, Continuing Bonds in Bereavement book is about, is how, uh, you know, like um, the main, like say for example, uh, someone has, has passed away. The mainstream explanation of course, is that, you know, that person is, is no longer with us and they're dead. And yet we know from loads of research that people continue to have um, experiences or visions, apparitions of, of dead loved ones and all sorts of, encounters with them after death so actually you know a healthier framework might be a more ontologically flood, flooded framework for dealing with that kind of experience you know it doesn't you know the therapist may not believe it for themselves but as a, a therapy tool for the you know individual who's having the experience just to say that they're actually you know it's actually possible <laughs> you know there are many frameworks that we can understand the world from many different cultural models in which spirits and interactions with the dead after death are entirely normal you know so just i think yeah you're exactly right it can open up that that space in lots of different ways therapeutically and uh yeah and you know in the um in the integral perspective on human development because basically a lot of what you're saying is what they would call the multi-perspectival mm -hmm. level and so in their understanding there's, there's a, a fair amount of maturity that's required before we can actually embody a multi-perspectival framework. And I'm wondering how you, how you view that. Well, yeah, I think it takes practice. <laughs> and, um, you know, you can see, you know, trying to, like we've already talked about some of the dangers associated with it. Mm. You know, that it's mm. something that you need to develop a, I think a sense for, but yeah, I don't know how <laughs> exactly other than through engaging with as many different things as possible and uh, experiencing things and uh, yeah, and just learning how to accommodate it. <laughs> when I, when I feel you, I, I sense a very beautiful curiosity. Oh, thanks. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm really grateful for your, your work, Jack. Thank you very much. So, thanks, Sheila um ethan you had a few questions if you can choose one 
Yeah, so one of them pretty much got answered. So I'll choose this one, which was very simply, what do you see as like next steps for introducing the ontology that includes the paranormal and spirits and psi phenomena and as a possibility into our culture? Yeah, <laughs> well, I think the next steps are to do with um, yeah, education again, you know, and having a space. I think actually we're in a good place, like with these kinds of forums now. Uh, for these kinds of conversations to be had. So I think this is the next step, isn't it, is to explore the idea with uh, different groups of people um, and to hopefully, yeah, encourage people to, to think about the world um, in those kinds of ways. And not in like an evangelical kind of mission or anything, <laughs> but just, yeah, a gentle um, exploration of different possibilities. I think that's the way forwards. Yeah, I had a little bit of a follow too. Like, I'm having str trouble understanding what the ontology is that is incorporating that because you have the materialist ontology, and then I'm really struggling to understand like what do other ontologies look like? What is like the psi phenomenon? Yeah. What is that ontology? Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, each ontology could be completely different. I mean, let's take like Christianity has its own ontology, which has heaven and hell and all of purgatory and or whatever, you know, even different forms of Christianity have got their own ontologies. Some ontological models like idealism, for example, say that there is no matter, well, the matter itself is a product of the mind or some kind of a universal mind, you know, so there's many different possibilities. And the point I'm just trying to make is that materialism or, you know, the standard materialism any of the way that we because i don't think we should throw materialism out necessarily again it's one part of this whole big picture so the new ontology will be one that is able to incorporate you know, more than just matter um, and you know maybe even other things beyond <laughs> who knows but that's how i see it anyway i don't know if that answers your question <laughs> yeah that, that gave me a better idea thanks uh, Kim, you had a, a question earlier. Yeah, I was just curious about um, any group practices. I, I've done some work with an organization called Animus that does a lot of nature-based work. And um, I didn't have a name for what was happening until I discovered your work. And um, But it, what I experienced was that and a lot of their work you do a number of days like out in the wilderness where you're engaging the other than human world and the first day of one particular experience a kid came back and he like encountered a knight in the forest and you know i was like the first day kind of like looking at the nature guides and everyone and no one was no one was sort of being like you didn't see a knight in the forest and and so what i noticed happening over a number of days is that when no one uh, denied your experience, your experience became like more vivid. And so it went from just this one kid encountering a night in the forest till seven days later, you know, we were encountering all kinds of beings out in the forest. And it made me really curious if that, that sort of, you know, the energy of the group or when no one's denying your experience, if it actually like in, increases your, uh, your, the possibility that you can actually see and encounter. And I'm just curious, I, for me, it was like a weird, just like phenomena of their work. But then when I discovered your work, I was like, oh, is that really what was happening as we were, but if you could speak to that, it'd be great. Yeah, I think, um, I think yes. <laughs> We do, and, and kind of our beliefs and expectations and all of those kind of things really do, especially in, in commun communal situations or with m many people involved, sometimes do become external realities. I mean, I, I do a lot of research in para well, writing in parapsychology as well, and there's a lot of um, evidence around the role of belief in parapsychology and the manifestation of psi phenomena. There's a very famous study called the sheep goat effect, um, which basically says that the sheep are people who believe in psi and the goats are people who disbelieve in psi. 
And um, it's found very frequently in Psi tests that people who are goats, who don't believe, score very poorly in Psi experiments. Sometimes they even score Psi negative results, which is kind of like weird in itself, that you can get even worse than the low chance. <laughs> and uh, then the goats who, I mean, so the sheep who are believers will score you know, higher in those experiments. So, you know, if, you if you're in a situation where an experience hasn't been denied, then that creates possibility in the minds of others. Uh, there was a, a parapsychologist called Kenneth Batcheldor who did studies with um, table tipping and psychokinesis. And it's interesting, he found that if he incorporated what he called uh, an artifact or a faked um, effect early on in his experiment, it was often enough to tip people's belief in that moment. You know, they've seen something extraordinary and now they're open to the possibility of it. And then genuine psychokinesis occurred later on. Okay, so cool stuff like that, uh, which I think, yeah, if you have a, a group of people who are not shutting down beliefs, but are actually engaging it and then telling stories and building it up, then yes, you will experience more. <laughs> Any follow-up question or share, Kim? Um, do you have time for one more question, Jack, or do you have a hard stop at the, the top? Do one more question. One more question. Um, Mike, uh, if you can ask your question. Hi, Jack. Um, thanks for a really interesting presentation. I really enjoyed that. It's close to my subject, close to my heart. So quick question. Well, maybe it's not so quick. Do you think ontologies are actually active in constructing realities and frameworks of what's possible? Yeah, I do. I think um, that feeds into what I was just saying about the role of belief and expectation and all those kind of things. And, you know, um, yeah, definitely. And in like, this is what Edith Turner was trying to say with her, her research as well. That you need to learn to see as people in other ontologies see, because, you know, if you step into that, framework and you open yourself up to the possibility that spirits exist then like we were just saying you're li likely then to have experiences of it so there's a weird like feedback loop kind of effect at play and it's not a com it's not a simple thing <laughs> what i'm trying to say i don't think i'm quite expressing the complexity of of this issue i don't think i, I actually can but you know it is it's a feedback of our participation with the world and the world also feeds back into us as well. So yes, I definitely think that our frameworks, our beliefs, our ontological um, models impact the way that we experience the world, but also the way that the world presents itself to us. Any uh, follow-up question or share, Mike? You're on mute still. No, I, I'm I'm good with that. I com I completely agree. I, I actually think that I describe ontologies um, as being what I would call performative. So they actually they're actually acts of creation. Forget mm -hmm. about the idea that forget about the idea that there's passive there's some kind of passive objectivity involved in in the ontology. It isn't. It's an active an active creative thing. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> Very cool. Cool. Uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, and so we're approaching the top of the hour. Uh, Jack, any kind of closing thoughts that you would like to leave us with or perhaps anywhere we could uh, find your work and what you're doing? Yeah, um, I have got a website, which is jack-hunter.webstarts.com. And um, you can find me in various different places on Facebook and so on. And I've got a couple of uh, upcoming um, book projects that might be of interest one called deep weird the varieties of high strangeness experience mm. which is uh, going to be an exploration of some of the, the most unusual kinds of extraordinary experiences and another hopefully uh, next year an edited book on the role of folklore um, in mediating our relationship with landscape mm. and in the environment um, specifically with the aim of promoting pro-environmental behaviors through you know animistic traditions indigenous knowledge systems and uh, yeah folklore <laughs> so some stuff coming up yeah some very cool stuff um that deep weird you got to come back to the store and have a conversation on that um, yeah. 
our friend uh, uh, Eric Davis. Uh, he, he came to the store before, and it might be a good conversation. Uh, yeah, yeah, you too. Um, so I'll make some closing announcements in a moment. But Jack, thank you so much for coming to the store today. I'd love to have you back. Um, and I guess I'll just plug my uh, or our next event here at the Stoa. Uh, Assetization, turning things into assets in techno scientific capitalism uh, should be fun. Uh, October, uh, September 27th at 12 uh, p.m. Eastern time. That's Monday. You can RSVP here or the stoa.ca. So that being said, Jack, everyone, thank you so much for coming to the stoa today. Thank you very much.